Well, so people, this is our last podcast of the year and it's just as well we're finishing with a week to go till Christmas because I'm in chaos. I don't know about you two. How are you doing? Um, no, I'm not. I Well, I've got my Christmas cards written. Christmas cards? Um, but, I, yeah, but I mean, why? Why bother? The postal strikes um, are going to put pages and getting there on time. Um, but I'm not ready, but I am in the mood because um, I was interested in your podcast last week when people were talking about the appeal of carol services. And I've been making a little podcast about um, people from non-Christian traditions um, who sing in Christian choirs at Christmas and why they do it. And so I've been listening to lots of carols in my editing and it's been really lovely. Oh, that's nice. Leo, how about you? Well, I told you I missed um, Stir Up Sunday, which is normally a uh, Sunday in November, which I can never remember. So busy this year. But I finally last Sunday made the Christmas cake and two puddings. I normally do what I call the Delia Plus, uh, because the Delia Plus means plus lots of alcohol, uh, loads of it. So the fruit all soaks, did the cake, perfect. Now I'm feeding it marzipan on today. Oh, you're both so efficient. Oh. Okay, so this is Hannah Scott Joint with Rosie Dawson and Leo Devine for the Religion Media Centre podcast. And today we're going to be looking back at a couple of the big stories of the year. But first, for you both, um, what stands out? Doesn't have to be something newsy or even from the podcast. Could be another bit of your working life. We heard about your carols, Rosie. But but what stands out for you from this year? Um, two things. Um, one was um, going to Canterbury for the Lambeth Conference, um, where there was a lovely sort of um, journalistic pack to be part of. And to just be at a great big in-person event after COVID was just really great. And that did seem to be, I sort of thought, well, we got stories that we wouldn't have got there, even if we'd spoken to all the people we spoke to by Zoom, just because of the event itself. Um, and kind of bumping into people and talking to people as well there. Yeah, but the atmosphere, you can't get the atmosphere on Zoom, if, even if you're talking to all those people individually. So that was, a, that was a work highlight. Leo, how about you for this year? Well, I'm with Rosie on the Lambeth Conference because I'd never been before. I mean, it, it was really an exciting time to be there, to see it in action, although it was um, slightly fractured, I think, in terms of all the discussions. But I think for me, the story that stands out, and I know that all three of us cut our reporting teeth in local radio. Absolutely. So to see the, the huge cutbacks and that service so important to people across the whole of England um, to be cut right back is very, very disappointing and alarming, to be honest. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, we have talked about so much um, across this year on the podcast, it's difficult to think how to sum it up. So what we've done is chosen a couple of stories that have been especially significant and that will very much be ongoing in 2023. No sign of ending anytime soon, as of course Russia's offensive against Ukraine. I think we're on day 296 since it began. And with us to discuss that is Times columnist and Lib Dem politician Edward Lucas. And the other story we've chosen is the death of Her Majesty the Queen in September and of course the immediate accession of King Charles III. So we'll look back at what was an extraordinary couple of weeks and ahead to the King's coronation next year with another uh, journalist and writer, Catherine Pepinster. But first to you, Edward. Um, in 2008, your book, The New Cold War, Putin's Threat to Russia and the West, was published at a time when I, I guess the world was thinking of Putin as kind of someone we could do business with, which seems extraordinary looking back now. But clearly you were under no illusions. And I'm guessing his invasion of Ukraine in February was absolutely no surprise to you at all. No, it wasn't, and it shouldn't have been to anyone, um, not least because the invasion started in 2014. Um, it intensified um, in February of this year. And really, our problems with Russia predate Putin. They go back to the um, early 1990s, and people were warning the West even then that Russia was on a trajectory of um, more repression at home and more aggression abroad, and that Russian imperialism had not ended with the um, with the collapse of the Soviet Empire. And unfortunately, the people who delivered those warnings were patronized and belittled as well as being ignored. And it was only when someone with my sort of background working for The Economist and um, writing in, in English for a well-connected publisher made the case that it started to have some impact. And people did laugh quite a lot in 2008 and said, oh, this is r ridiculous. And there was a kind of phrase in the Foreign Office called Crazy Edward Lucas Talk. Um, so I, but I take no pleasure in being vindicated. You know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people are um, you know, maimed and traumatized, and you know, hundred thousand plus people are dead, and uh, millions of people are homeless. And it was all all avoidable. 
Mm. Edward, how did, I mean, if you can just sum up for us, I know it's difficult, but how, how did we get it so wrong in the West? Well, I think it was a mixture of um, ignorance, first of all. We didn't really understand the, um, it was the, 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 the fall of the Berlin Wall um, produced this sort of swathe of countries that we didn't really know very much about and didn't take very seriously. I think that's exemplified by the sort of Borat films which treat Eastern Europe as um, inherently ridiculous. The one country we did know about was Russia, so we thought that must be the most important one. And ignorance begets arrogance, and arrogance begets complacency. And then most of all, I'm afraid it was greed. There was an enormous amount of money to be made in Russia in the 90s and noughties, and a lot of Westerners um, filled their trousers with that, and not only got very rich, but got very good at trying to silence critics. And I experienced this when I was the Moscow bureau chief of The Economist in the late 90s, early noughties. And um, very well connected um, British uh, expats were trying to have me f- fired and silenced because I was bad for business. So I think greed has always been the West's Achilles heel, and um, it's come back to bite us now. But of course, the, the Ukrainians are paying the real price. Mm. And, and I mean, Putin thought I, that it, it, the war would all be done and dusted fairly swiftly, didn't he? And yet here we are, 296 days in. So how did he get that so wrong? Well, I think. Uh, Many people in the the West, including me, thought that he wasn't going to attack because the war would be so disastrous and it would um, make much more sense for him to try and menace um, Ukraine and extract concessions from Ukraine and from the West than actually go to war. And I think we were right and he was wrong in that our our analysis was quite quite correct. Um, But he has um, grossly overestimated the ability of his army to do combined operations against a near-peer adversary. The Ukrainians have shown they are far better at defense than the Russians are at attack. And I think it's now pretty clear Russia is going to lose this war. It's just a question of how and when. Um, Edward, um, I've got a a Ukrainian neighbor now. um, And um, I was talking to her about the Orthodox Christmas. And um, she said that this year, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church are saying celebrate it on, on Christmas Day. And her understanding was that this is a very clear um, way of separating itself from the Russian Orthodox Church, which, which it did, I know, f- uh, formally um, in, in 2019. Um, but what, what is it? What I, I don't think I'd appreciate it is how absolutely central the position of the Orthodox Churches is to this, this conflict. Yes, it's it's one of those things that it gets more complicated the more you look at it because there are uh, there were several Orthodox churches in Ukraine, one which was under Moscow, one which was under Kiev, um, with ties to Constantinople, and another one which was autocephalic, which is a nice word one doesn't get to use very often. Um, but the, the all the non-Moscow ones have merged. There's also the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, which is Orthodox in liturgy, um, but is um, part part of the, the Sort of broader Roman Catholic Church and ultimately um, as allegiance to the, as the canonical supervision of the Pope. And um, that's uh, very strong in Western Ukraine and has been the sort of beating heart of Ukrainian nationalism, was very severely persecuted under uh, the Soviet period, has an enormous cathedral in the heart of London with an absolutely wonderful bishop called Kenneth, born in Vancouver, who's um, made it into a huge relief centre. Uh, but I think that religion has has come back in a very powerful way since 1991 um, in Ukraine and quite different from in in Russia. The, the Russian Orthodox Church has replaced the Communist Party as the sort of ideological um, centerpiece of the Putin regime, but in a, uh, I, to me, deeply unchristian way. It's sort of obscurantist and quite totalitarian, and, um, whereas the U- Ukrainian Church, I think, has, is very keen on linking, not, not shutting Ukraine off from the outside world, but linking it to it. And the decision to celebrate Christmas at the same time as um, most of Christendom, I, I think, is probably part of that. But what I've noticed um, in reporting this month is that the Ukraine security forces have been raiding monasteries of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church because they think they've been infiltrated by Russians and they're sort of talking about um, congregations singing um, hymns and songs supporting Russia, speaking about a unified Russia and so on. And that I think a lot of monasteries in the Kharkiv region have also been raided. So there's an idea that the Ukrainian Orthodox Church um, has still a lot of sympathisers towards Russia within it. 
It's not quite like that. I think I mean, remember there's, there's difference you know, the, the, when you say Ukrainian Orthodox Church. There is the the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which is loyal to Moscow, which has, which recognises the Patriarch of Moscow um, uh, as as their ultimate chief. I mean, obviously God is the ultimate chief, but as their sort of secular um, earthly 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 leader. And then there's the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which is under the the Kiev Patriar- Patriarchate, and there is a lot of friction between the two of them. Um, but I, I but I think if I understand it right, it's the Moscow Patriarchate monasteries and churches that have um, come, come under pressure, and for good reason because they are they tend to attract, although not not always. It, you know, some people have very strong political views one way and religious views the other. Um, just as you can be a very patriotic um, British person, but still um, belong to the Roman Catholic Church, which sees the Pope as the head. So it's not not it's not necessarily a sign of uh, of, of, of conflict. It may just be where you brought up, but on on, on the whole, the uh, uh, Moscow Patriarchate churches tend to um, attract people who are loyal to Moscow and their clergy particularly have been seen as a sort of vector of influence um, for, for, for Moscow and therefore I think come under quite deserved scrutiny. Catherine, can I ask you about um, about the, the Pope's response to Ukraine? Because he's, well, maybe I should ask Edward first and then, then Catherine come in because, I mean, he's been criticised for being a bit vacillating about it, hasn't he? Um, he's written articles or have been interviewed where he's sort of suggested earlier on perhaps a sort of false equivalence between Putin and, and, and the and the West. Um what what's your take on that? I'm deeply disappointed and I think that many of the Greek Catholic um faithful are, are disappointed as well. Um it's changed a bit. I think that and he actually broke down while giving a speech about the war in Ukraine and he's um said that we should celebrate Christmas for the people of Ukraine in our hearts. But I think he comes from a sort of left wing Latin American tradition where um, whatever the United States wants is probably wrong. And this chimes with a lot of the global south, which sees this basically not as a colonial war being waged by the former imperial power against a rebellious subject, which I'd argue it is, um, but a sort of east west proxy war in which the American proxy is getting a kicking. And so his, um, I think his instincts have been um, to, uh, as you say, to pursue a sort of line of moral equivalence. And that's been terribly hurtful for um, many of the, you know, the U- U- Ukrainian faithful. Um, I, I, I hope he's um, moving towards a different, uh, different stance now. Um, but the sort of lazy peacemaking is a, a, ter- a ter- terrible trap where you put the aggressor and the perpetrator together and say, now play nicely. I think it's fascinating to see how geopolitics impacts upon uh, the papacy. So with John Paul II, we had the absolute opposite of what Edward has identified. We had uh, a Polish pope who uh, was deeply suspicious with absolute justification of the then Soviet Union. He stood up against them and uh, was prepared to to speak speak about what he, what he saw and what he knew and what he'd experienced. And at the same time, he was deeply suspicious of what was happening in Central and Latin America because his reaction to uh, what was going on there was coloured by his experience of uh, socialism and communism in Eastern Europe. So we, we, have, a, we have a pope who in a way is... is, is rather than the opposite of what we had with John Paul II. Tell me a, a more about this, because I, I, I'm i quite new to it, but I read about this meeting that Pope Francis had with Patriarch Kirill in 2016, where they, they had this declaration calling to for an end to persecution of Christians in the Middle East, an end to wars in the region, and hope for further unity. You'd sort of think that that could be a basis for some kind of 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 meeting some kind of conversations at this point at this incredibly kind of you know crucial dangerous point wouldn't you edward well, not really. I'm afraid I, I, I'm deeply sceptical about the Moscow Patriarchate in, in all aspects, and I'm afraid I'm also deeply, deeply disappointed with the um, with um, Pope Francis, not just on on Russia, but particularly on China, where he's shown a scandalous disregard for the persecuted faithful in um, mainland China, living under the rule of the Chinese Communist Party, and is has been unwilling to stand up for Cardinal Zen, the marvellous um, Hong Kong cardinal who's um, been facing a series of uh, legal harassments and potential jail sentences and so on for his support for the pro-democracy movement there. And he also seems to be um, edging away from the the Holy See's diplomatic ties with Taiwan, um, which has also been a great bastion of, 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 of hope for 
um, faithful in the region. So I, I, I'm afraid I give him naught out of 10, uh, really, for geo, geopolitics generally. And I, I think that the Moscow Patriarchate is basically just the religious affairs department of the Kremlin and should be treated as such. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, I think we have to bring this bit to a close. But I mean, I, I hardly dare ask, um, Edward, uh, but, you know, this year has been a year of you know, the brutality of war. And, and we're so aware of Ukrainians struggling through this horrendously cold winter. Um, and of course, the displacement of thousands around the world and here in the UK. Looking into 2023, um, there's been a warning. Ukraine have warned of a major Russian offensive in February, some are saying January. Um, what do you think is going to happen next? If I knew that, I'd be sitting at a desk at MI6 rather than being on this some excellent podcast. I, th I think that the um, this is Putin's last winter. I think he's in bad shape and his war's in bad shape. And I think that as the military setbacks intensify, the political pressure in Moscow will rise and we will have some new regime probably by right by this time next year, um, which will be a lot more difficult to deal with. Um, but probably the war will be, I think the, the, the war will probably be over in the sense that there'll be some sort of ceasefire. And we'll then have to deal with the traumatized Ukraine, which is sort of victorious, but needing a great deal of help and a very resentful and defeated Russia, which will be um, extremely unpleasant to deal with. Oh, well, thanks for that. Um, Edward, thank you. Um, stay with us. But um, let's turn now to Catherine, journalist and royal constitution coronation expert. So let's just cast our minds back to September and the quite extraordinary couple of weeks starting on that Thursday evening when we all heard the news that the Queen had died. And there's this weird thing, Catherine, isn't there? When someone's very old, and I think 96 could be fairly regarded as, as very old, when you sort of think they're going to go on forever. And with the Queen bizarrely, it kind of felt like that. It, I don't know. I, I mean, it's mad, of course, but it kind of did feel like that. Yes, I think I think to many people it did. Although at the same time, uh, we had seen her grow increasingly thin and frail, and she seemed to be sort of slightly fading from view because she was uh, not appearing so often in public. Those appearances had become increasingly intermittent. There was the occasional footage of her talking to people on Zoom. So she she seemed to become, be, be becoming this smaller and smaller sort of figure that's sort of distancing away. But but yes, you're right. I think many people felt that she she would go on forever. Um and of course that was reinforced by the fact that so many people had had either never lived in an in another monarchy, um, another reign, uh, or if they had, they could barely remember it. I mean, you you must have had to have been about seventy seven to have had any real memory of um, another another monarch, her father, and in another coronation. So, yes, yeah, although she was old, it nevertheless seemed a dramatic moment when she died. However, I I had expected. Um, that the psychological impact on the country would be really quite considerable, uh, and it and it wasn't. I don't think. I mean, that um, <clears throat> I th I thought people would be really discombobulated by this, and I'm not sure that they were quite. They they came out to pay tribute. Yes, I mean there was a massive reaction. Yes, there was a huge reaction, but I it it wasn't the kind of almost hysteria that I remember in 1997 when Diana died. It was a lot, seemed a lot kind of dignified and quieter. But I, I think that that had a lot to do with the uh, ceremonial. So the kind of framework that was there. The morning, the, there was a framework, there was a structure and, and, and the church played its role in that. And also Britain is used to, to dealing with transition from one monarch to the other, it has that framework all in place as well. So there was this sense of continuity. And it, it was really striking that this happened at a time of enormous political turmoil in this country. And we had a, a new prime minister who then lasted just a matter of weeks. So the, the monarchy, in contrast to, to politics, seem to be offering something very stable, despite the fact that this person who'd been head of state for 70 years was off the stage. 
That's so interesting. And of course, you brought out your book earlier this year, Defenders of the Faith, the British Monarchy, Religion and the Next Coronation, published in timely fashion in June 2022. This has been quite a year for you and the things that you are particularly expert in. And and, and I gather there's a paperback coming out. So you're having to do some rewriting there fairly swiftly. Yes. Well, um, sadly, some of that consists of putting all the stuff about Elizabeth II into the past tense. But I'm also writing more about the new king and about um, more about the coronation as will be coming our way in a few months and also looking at uh, how how we did respond to the Queen's death. And one of the things that particularly interested me about when the Queen died was the queue. You remember the queue? Yes. Oh, good grief. No one will ever forget the queue. The queue, which was quite an extraordinary thing in itself. And um, if you if you wanted to, you could watch it live via a BBC uh, webcam. And I went along to it and it was a united kingdom, actually. It was quite a remarkable cross-section of society that came out uh, to uh, spend anything between five and 12 hours queuing to pay their tribute by walking past her coffin in Westminster Hall. I'm struck by what you say about, um, you know, that this sort of big psychological moment that you were sort of um, expecting, that we were expecting, I, I sort of felt the same. What I'm, I'm amazed now looking back at, you know, how, as you imply, we've, we just sort of moved through it. But the queue notwithstanding, the thing that I've noticed most is that when I've spoken about it to people under 30, it it really didn't register with them that much. Um, you know, I've I, I made a point of saying, you know, how have you felt about, you know, the Queen dying, the Queen passing? And an awful lot of them were just, well, they noticed, but but that was it. And I just wonder whether you feel you, you've observed the same or, or what that might mean for the future of the monarchy. It's a very important issue um, you know, as to whether the monarchy is something which uh, will be accepted. I, I don't, I don't get the impression that there's a vociferous republican movement in this country, that a, a substantial republican movement. I think it's a small, maybe vociferous movement, but the the. The issue for younger people might be more apathy than actual objection to it uh, at the moment. Although, I mean, having said that, in that queue, there seemed to be as many young people as there were old, um, and they, you know, they, they they hadn't all turned out in Union Jack waistcoats, so they weren't, you know, that kind of sort of you know fanatic. But yes, I'm sure there are there are younger people for whom it, it doesn't register that much, and of course. Uh, I'm sure that um, the uh, the monarchy, uh, the royal family, the royal households at one time would have thought they could uh, carry younger people with them when their then most popular um, royal married a mixed race American actor. And that, of course, has all gone pear shaped. So is that helping or hindering the Harry and Meghan stuff? I think it might. I think it might hinder in terms of young people that that the these were two people within the royal family that they might connect more with than the others so in that way it might hinder that that division that's that's grown up but i don't see it as being you know that, that it's going to be such a a shocking thing what they're saying that that it's going to cause um the coronation to be cancelled, or I mean, I think things are just going ahead, um, and we'll we'll have we'll have to see what the response of the public is. I saw a poll the other day, and I think the new king is certainly not as popular as his mother was, but he's not unpopular in the way he once was during the traumas with his first wife. He's got that um, job now, hasn't he, which is central to your book, Catherine. He is the defender of the faith. He's the supreme governor of the Church of England. Do you think he will? He's going to say, isn't he, in the coronation next year that he does want to defend or um, look out for all faiths? Is it going to be in the same way? Do you think because Her Majesty the Queen was very obviously in that role? How do you think it's going to be for Charles? I think one of the most 
interesting things for me that that happened in the days between the Queen's death and the funeral was that the new king had a reception for faith leaders at Buckingham Palace uh, where he gave a very short speech, which I understand he did write himself, where he pointed out um, that he was a committed Anglican, but that he that he's he did see a duty which was to protect other faiths. Uh, he has spent time as Prince of Wales uh, meeting a lot of people from different leaders from different faiths, other Christian denominations. And I think that now is is uh, bearing fruit. Uh, they are very much behind him as the new king. There is, there is at the moment. There's no indication that the that the oath, the standard oath of the British monarch uh, at the coronation, when when the monarch is asked whether they will uh, pledge to uphold the Protestant religion, will will change. I think it's going to stay the same. Um, I know we need to wrap up really soon, but Edward, I just wonder if you've got um, any observations on this. I'm um, certainly Prince Philip, but also King um, Charles have have had a real empathy with orthodoxy haven't they yes i think that prince charles has shown a degree of sensitivity to um the eastern tradition which isn't always the hallmark of um public life in britain but i i i i'm just rather disappointed that he hasn't done more in his first hundred days he's given this is a job he's been waiting for for um the last 70 years or something um, I, 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 I'm waiting for a sort of the big speech or the something that would define his um, time on on the throne. I, I wonder if he, he's sort of feeling bruised and being slapped down about wanting to go to the climate change conference in Egypt, where the government basically said you can't you can't go. Um, but I I feel there's a sort of sense of slightly sort of tra- tragic inactivity hanging over Buckingham Palace, really, that his mother was able to attract enormous sympathy and attention for doing things in a very particular way, which um, was sort of hallowed by precedent. And somehow he doesn't quite fill her shoes and um, doesn't quite know where he's walking, to make some metaphors. Well, of course, we do have the first King's speech on Christmas Day. So who knows what that will contain. Edward, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, just before we end, Leo, have you got any Christmassy quirks for us to go out on? Well, yes, I've got, I've got my quirky story of the year, but I just wanted to say very quickly, the, the Queen met uh, five popes, I was amazed to read, including Pius XII, just before she became Queen. But when she met Francis in 2014, so it's a slightly quirky story, she gave him a bottle of Balmoral whiskey. Uh, he gave her a papal decree from 1679. And I was just thinking that when he saw that whiskey, he must have been thinking, papal decree? That Italian Chianti might have been a better idea. Thought that one through, absolutely. But but my quirky story of the year um, has to be Pablo the Singing Goat. Uh, Worcester Cathedral, uh, it was a blessing ceremony for animals. We love those. Uh, Pablo, when he heard the organ, couldn't resist joining in. You like that, Hannah, don't you? Oh, Pablo does it for me every All time. Creatures great and small. Indeed, indeed. I'm only sad we haven't got a goat at our crib service or a donkey. Come to that. I'm going to have to work on that for next year. Um, that's this week's Religion Media Centre podcast. And that's it for the year. So from Leo, Rosie and myself, thanks for being with us through 2022. Happy Christmas, happy Hanukkah, happy whatever you're doing over the next couple of weeks. And we will be back in 2023. Bye for now. The Religion Media Centre is an impartial and independent organisation providing an expert resource for the media and other interested parties to help the reporting and understanding of religion and beliefs. You can find news, fact sheets, briefings and lots more on the website at religionmediacentre.org.uk where you can also sign up for a daily roundup of stories about religion and belief from the UK and around the world straight to your inbox. If you'd like to support the podcast and the work we do, contributions are very welcome. Thank you if you do, have or will. It all helps us continue to tell the stories that matter and it's hugely appreciated.